right. Good evening, Sainikum, and um, welcome to the Black Muslim Lecture Series. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name is Fatima Tujah Salim. I am a member of the community, and it is truly a privilege for me to be part of the team that put this programming together. And um, I, before we get started, I just wanted to take a few minutes to do a quick overview of the program tonight and introduce our speakers. Um, but before that, I just wanted to take a minute to thank the people that helped this happen. I want to start with Imam Khaled, who's not in the room right now because he is doing what Imam Khaled does, uh, getting the food ready for dinner for us later. But really, him, the entire team, uh, the marketing, uh, Brother Khaled, uh, thank you so much. Um, I want to thank our speakers, uh, Dr. Rasul, Dr. Kamal, um, and Sister Aisha Adawiya, who is supposed to be with us, but unfortunately for health reasons couldn't join us. So please keep in your prayers. Now I'm going to complete Shifa. Um, and so with that, I want to tell you a little bit about what the Black Muslim Lecture Series is. So the Black Muslim Lecture Series is a monthly program that aims to bring to New York City uh, scholars and artists uh, of African descent uh, who, and highlight their voices and their perspectives. Our hope really is that this series will bring forth the stories um, of the Muslim of African descent and that all of us, regardless of our backgrounds, regardless of religion and race, um, can grow from it and learn from it, inshallah. And what better place for us to start than the city we are in, New York? Um, hence our topic for tonight. Historical perspectives on the Black Muslim experience in New York City. Uh, we're really excited to have uh, Dr. Rasul and Dr. Kamal. I will be introducing Dr. Rasul, uh, who is an assistant professor at UC Irvine um, in California. He has his PhD from the University of Pennsylvania in History and Africana Studies. Dr. Miller's work explores the history of Black Muslim communities in the Atlantic world, Black radicalism, and its impact on social and cultural movements in the 20th century US, Black internationalism, and West African intellectual history. Um, we're particularly excited to have him for tonight because his current book project is titled Black World Revelation. Islam, Race, and Radical Internationalism in New York City from 1930 to 1990. And it examines the early 20th century Black Orthodox Muslim congregation in and around New York City and the cultural and political orientations that characterize subsequent communities of Black Muslims in the US who built robust transnational networks as they actively engaged traditions and communities of Muslims on the African continent. With that, Dr. Thank you. 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 Welcome everyone. Um, and thank you so much for that awesome introduction. My name is Rasul Miller. Um, and it's nice to be back here, um, both in New York City, where I lived for a number of years, but also uh, in NYU in particular, which is a place that provided me a lot of community when I lived here. Um, I split my time between here and, and the Mosque of the Summer Brotherhood up in Harlem, which if you haven't been to, I would encourage you to get up there and go visit. Um, but in any case, we wanted to talk a little bit this evening about uh, some of the history of Islam um, among African Americans here in New York City um, as a way really to um, sort of begin to 
learn more and talk more and discuss more of the broader history of Islam in this, in this part of the world. Um, we also, um, and I know I'm saying something that, that Sayyidina Fatima already said, but we had hoped to have Sister Aisha Adwia, who is really an institution here in, uh, in New York City, um, really a bearer of a very long, rich legacy of, of active, engaged Muslim women's leadership in New York City. Um, and link to that to that tradition, and um, you know I don't really know. I know she's in the hospital. I'm not really sure what the situation is, but again, I just wanted to encourage everybody to keep her in your dua. Inshallah. Yes, yes. And Sister Aisha actually, uh, among the many things that she's known for, she worked at the Schomburg Center for many years, the Schomburg Center for Research and Black Culture uh, up in Harlem, and. If uh, another institution, if you're not familiar with the Schomburg, you should go visit the Schomburg. Um, an old, rich, important institution in New York City. Um, and if you are familiar with the Schomburg, you know, over the years they have done a fair amount, um, you know, inshallah, we, we always want to see more, but a fair amount to document the history of, of Islam in this, in this city, in this state. And really, Sister Aisha has been like the driving force behind that. Um, from the Malcolm X Project, Malcolm X Exhibit, now the Schomburg houses a lot of Malcolm X's personal um, archival documents to um, some of what we're going to talk about today, some of the efforts to document the archival history of the Islam movement, which is uh, at one time was the largest network of African American Sunni massages in the country. Right. So this is just a, a snapshot of some of what Sister Aisha has done. She also founded an organization called Women in Islam. So. Um, we're, we're, we're sad that we don't have her today, but we're gonna we're gonna include her, you know, in in our comments uh, because she's part of the history as well. I'm gonna start up by giving a little bit of a sort of broad stroke historical overview of Islam here in New York City. And when we talk about the history of Islam in New York and in America in general, we're talking about a history that actually goes back quite a ways, at least to the time of the transatlantic slave trade. Um, we know that a number, some say a third, some speculate maybe more than that, of the brothers and sisters, the men and women who were uh, brought captive and enslaved from the African continent, Western Central Africa, and brought here during the era of transatlantic slavery were, were Muslim. And we know from the very beginning of the transatlantic slave trade in the early, uh, the early 16th century, so the early 1500s, you know, among the very first people who were enslaved from uh, and brought from Africa to, to be slaves here, there were a number from Senegambia, right? Um, particularly, many of them were brought to, to present day Latin America, and they developed a reputation for um, fighting and for running away and for building community with the indigenous people and, and helping to introduce Islam among them, such that by the time you get to the 17th century, um, a number of the English and the later American slave traders try to avoid folks from Senegambia because they have a reputation for resisting. Um, but later, there was another sort of resurgence of, of Senegambian, um, you know, enslavement for, of folks from Senegambia for the, the cultivation of rice, right? So there's an ebb and flow, and it wasn't just Senegambia where, where Muslims were, were brought, but uh, I say that to kind of introduce it because we need to know that if we're talking about the history of Islam in America, that's where we have to start. Um, and in New York in particular, not too far from here, uh, some decades ago, there was a the discovery of an African burial ground. Um, and in that African burial ground, a number of the enslaved Africans and their descendants who were, who were buried there during the time of the transatlantic slave trade were discovered to have been buried wrapped in shrouds, right? Shrouded and facing the east. So even here in New York City, we know some of the enslaved Africans who were brought here under those circumstances were Muslim, right? Um, now, the preservation of uh, religious practices and religious identity uh, in the context of something as horrific and brutal as the transatlantic slave trade, as you can imagine, was very difficult. Oftentimes, children were, were taken away from their parents and um, not given the opportunity to learn and preserve their, their identity, their religion. But the memory of the, of the presence of Muslims among those enslaved never died out. And so this is why in the 20th century you find an upsurge of uh, interest in Islam among the descendants of those enslaved Africans. And you see in New York City a couple of institutions that play a key role in preserving that memory. 
One is Marcus Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association. So Marcus Garvey founded a movement which was the largest, still to this day, I think they say, the largest mass black movement in history with some more than two million followers worldwide. And among Marcus Garvey's followers, um, nationally and right here in New York, you found people embracing Islam. In fact, in New York, there was a conference and, and one of our teachers, you know, Talib Abdul Rashid, from the Mosque of Islamic Brotherhood, he, he writes about this a bit. Um, there actually was a conference of the, the UNIA, the United, the Universal Negro Improvement Association. I say it the second time, so it was a stick, inshallah. But it was a conference that Marcus Garvey thought was important enough that he came and chaired it himself to decide whether or not Islam should be adopted as the official religion of their movement, right? And another one of, one of our, our elders, uh, the man, Imam Sayyid Abdul Salam, he uh, actually showed me an old edition of uh, Marcus Garvey's Philosophy and Opinions, his, his book. And on the last page of this original edition, he, he has some kind of a warning to white Christian America. He says something like, you know, if you don't begin to treat us properly, you know, we may leave your religion. Would you have us go and embrace Allah, the God, the God of Africa, almost as a threat? <laughs> um, and so, and you had um, groups of Muslims who began to do work um, with the Garvey movement, right, from other communities, particularly the Ahmadiyya community and whatnot. Um, and you have another institution that's important in this history. You have another institution important in this history called the Moore Science Temple. Moore Science Temple is an organization that forms. The, the, generally, the date that's given for its its, uh, its beginning is, is 1913, um, and it's sometimes referred to or described as sort of a precursor to the Nation of Islam, which you may be more likely to have heard of. But this more Science Temple was another organization that uh, uh, sort of uh, celebrated the history of Islam among people of African descent in the Atlantic world, um, promoted Islamic identity, and uh, promoted the embrace among African Americans of this, this history, this historical narrative. And this happens in a moment during the early 20th century when you have the emergence of um, African, Hebrew, Israelite, black Jewish denominations as well, where black folks are migrating from the South to urban centers like New York City. This is, sorry, but this is the process people refer to historically as the Great Migration. And in this context, you start to see new religious movements, new religious congregations emerge among African Americans, and one of the things that people are grappling with is, what what are we, right? Like, coming out of a context where your history's been erased, right? You've been told your history sort of begins with slavery and being a Negro, which doesn't really tell you anything. And people are beginning to learn history and seeing that, no, in actuality, if you look at the history of African descended people, it's a, it's a history that includes or that connects with the uh, origins of various religious traditions, right? All three of the major monotheistic faiths can be argued to have, have uh, been uh, begun in Africa, and certainly by people who would have been racialized in early 20th century America as black, right? Um, and so that's part of the context for this. And in particular, for the sake of time, I, I won't say much more about the Morris Science Temple, but on the East Coast, right? So the Morris Science Temple is a, is a, is a community who, uh, in terms of their theology and their religious practices doesn't necessarily resemble sort of Islamic orthodoxy, right? But on the East Coast, in places like New York City, New Jersey, Philadelphia, Connecticut, even as early as the 1920s, you have communities associated with the Morris Science Temple that are actually engaged in things like making salat, like teaching Arabic, like inviting Muslim immigrants, the small numbers of Muslim immigrants that were present in these cities at the time, to be in community with them. Right? So this is sort of the backdrop that we need to understand when we think about how Islam emerges as a force in New York City and in the surrounding area. Right, And so by the 1930s, you have a number of, of congregations, a number of jamaats that begin to emerge. In Harlem, you have a community called the International Muslim Society. Right, Most people call it 303, right? by, uh, because it was located on 303 West 125th Street. And this is a community that was founded as sort of a partnership by some of those Garveyites and Morris Science Temple members, along with the small but growing numbers of Muslim immigrants from Somalia, from South Asia, um, mostly from those and from the Caribbean, right? So this is sort of the context for 303. You have another community, you have a very important figure in the history of Islam in New York City, two very important figures by the name of Sheikh Dawood Ahmed Faisal, 
and his wife, Mother Khadija Faisal. These are two Afro-Caribbean uh, immigrants, right, to Harlem in the early 20th century, who sort of come of age during the Harlem Renaissance, embrace Islam, become among the most prominent, most active promoters and teachers of Islam in the city. Um, in 1939, they actually moved from Harlem to Brooklyn, and they established a mutual community called the Islamic Mission of America on, uh, on, on, on State Street, on State Street in Brooklyn. So sometimes you hear it referred to as the State Street Mansion, or the State Street Mosque. And, and I'm introducing some of you, perhaps, to some of these communities, and we're going to talk about it a little bit more when we talk to Dr. Kamal about his journey in the Dean. So this is, uh, this is sort of the backdrop. Um, and, and you have to part of me because I see a lot, of, a lot of family in the room. So when I see family, I get happy. <laughs> and that's why I'm, you know, I'm the love. Um, so this is this 1930s, 1940s context. And this is important because when, because this history hasn't really been written <laughs> as of yet. We're writing it, right? Um, by the, we're trying to. We're trying to. People in your dua. By the 1950s, you see the emergence. So in 1930, you have the, the founding of a community called the Nation of Islam, which I'm going to assume. How many people have heard of the Nation of Islam before? Right. You almost said everybody's hand. How many people have seen How many people have heard of the Daughter of Islam movement? MashaAllah, <laughs> MashaAllah. Bad press. Bad press, right? So, more, press. more, more, need more press. So by 1950, so, so interestingly enough, I asked how many people heard of the Nation of Islam, people raised their hand. How many people heard of these other communities I mentioned? 303, the Daughter of the Islam Movement. Not, not as many, right? But in New York City, these communities were actually bigger and more established in 1940 than the Nation of Islam, right? But in the 1950s, something changes. The 1950s, the Nation of Islam really sort of explodes on the scene. Its program becomes more popular. Um, you find the rise of probably its most visible proponent um, Malcolm X, who then is sent to be the, the minister of the Harlem Mosque Number Seven, right? And in my conversations with Imam Talib, who's you're going to hear me mention certain people's names over and over again because I want you to be familiar with them as well. But in my conversations with Imam Talib, as he put it, the success of the Nation of Islam uh, uh, sort of pushed the Sunni Muslim community to take their dawah into the street. So the success of the Nation of Islam actually causes people to approach their their uh, organization of their communities as Sunni Muslims and how they, they, they go about trying to spread the, the message of their religion in a different kind of way. So you have a shift. When we talk about communities like Sheikh Dawood's mosque, Sheikh Dawood and Mother Khalid's mosque, we're talking about communities comprised mostly of families, a lot of musicians, um, whereas educators, whereas when we talk about later communities, we're talking about communities that, have, that, that are a lot more concerned with building political economic power, right? Achieving self-determination. Some of the things that the Nation of Islam is uniquely successful in doing, right? And so, one of the communities that I hope we focus on, what we're gonna focus on mostly today, is a community that emerges in 1962. So in 1962, I think. In 1962, some, some of the, the, the young brothers who were attending Sheikh Dawood and Mother Khadija's mosque, right, actually, sort of, I don't know, break away is the right word, right? But they, they establish a new community, right? They establish a new meeting place for the, the practice of their religion, right? And black nationalist roots in the Dalai as well. Say again? A lot of black nationalist roots mm -hmm. in the Dalai as well. And the politicization of Islam, which it took their oath, there's no politics in Islam. Right, right, right. right. So, 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 and, uh, right, right. And I'm gonna wrap up in a minute and we're gonna, <laughs> no, I want, because we're about, we about to have a big transition, inshallah. But, you know, the way that I, and, and this is this is difficult or nuanced, but, but really good, right, to, for us to, to have this part of the conversation. So, one of the things that I talk about when I try to write about this history and talk to people about this history, there's a shift that happens from that 1950s, 1960s moment where the way black politics is articulated and embraced changes, right? So we can think of the 1940s, 1950s moment as a moment characterized by a kind of black internationalism. Sheikh Dawood and Mother Khadija, for their part, were, you know, came of age during the Harlem Renaissance. Rena 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 they celebrated Africanity. They celebrated African history. They celebrated a kind of pride for people of African descent in that history. But they also focused on 
the idea of a, of, of a community, a kind of internationalist community, where they saw it as being very important to create a home and a space for Muslim immigrants from Sudan, from Yemen, from places like this, right? And by the time we get to the 1960s, the communities in which African American people live in, in New York City and around the country, begin to change, right? Now you start to find communities that are impacted by things like um, urban decay and things like increased urbanization, right? Deindustrialization. You start to see communities that look a little bit more homogenous. Police brutality becomes more of a problem than it was before. And so the priorities of communities begin to change. Now, before when you had small communities of immigrants in places, of small immigrant communities from places like Yemen and, and Bangladesh who were building community with African American Muslims in Harlem and Brooklyn, now they're establishing their own communities and their own ethnic enclaves, right? So now you have African American communities faced with a certain set of political economic problems, right? Fueled by things like racism and hypercapitalism, they have to fend for themselves, right? And so the priorities of communities change. And so you need uh, a new approach to be able to meet those needs. And in specifically the case of Sheikh Dawood after Faisal, he's like in his 70s now, right? And he's starting to um, go through the kind of transitions that sometimes some people go through when they get to a certain space where, you know, maybe he was a little less patient <laughs> with some of the young energy in his community. And so some of those younger folks, they branched out and they started a new community in 1962. And by the late 1960s, this community had become one of the most robust, one of the most compelling, one of the most impactful Muslim communities in the country at the time, right? And this is the thought of the Islam movement. And in many ways, when we think about Islam in New York City, and in urban spaces around the country, we can think about the Dawn of Islam movement and the Nation of Islam as being the two forces that sort of that sort of create the culture of what Islam is, right? In the sense that where if you walk down 125th Street, right, and you see a brother who is selling um, incense and oils, right, wearing a thobe, this is an aesthetic that I associate with the Dawn of Islam movement, which created the first incense making factory, right? which focused on creating a situation where brothers could, could have gainful employment that still allowed them to dress in the sunnah and go to the masjid and pray five times a day. And then if you go a little bit further up 125th Street, you might see somebody wearing a bow tie selling you a bean pot in Muhammad Speaks newspaper, right? And so, you know, even just, and, and for time's sake, I can't go into too much, as much detail as I'd like, but even the print culture of African American communities and African American Muslim communities in this in this uh, moment is very very important, right? So the Dawn of Islam movement creates a, a newspaper called the Jihad Al Akbar, right? And so you see some of the different ideological and intellectual flavor and debates of the various communities that make up the landscape of Islam in America at this time play out in publications like the Jihad Al Akbar, right? Or the Mosque of Islam Brotherhood has the Western Sunrise, right? And Nation of Islam has the Muhammad Speaks newspaper. But the last thing I'll say before we transition to the next part of our, of our conversation is what's important to, to bear in mind is in this moment of the 1960s, 1970s, is this shift in emphasis toward building independent Muslim political economies, right? Businesses, schools, these kinds of institutions, you know, uh, periodicals, newspapers, right? Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll, when we kind of circle back, we can kind of talk a little bit more about how these various communities have sort of impacted the communities that you may encounter today, right? When you go around to the different societies that are here now, you see many of them are sort of intellectual and cultural descendants of some of these communities that we've been talking about, right? Um, but what I want to do now is I want to hand it over to uh, to you know my my elder, <laughs> my uncle, uh, Dr. Kamal Hassan Ali, and Dr. Kamal Hassan Ali is was a member of the Daughter of Islam movement um, and is the author of a book that I would encourage everybody to check out. It's one of very few sort of uh, text on the Daughter of Islam movement actually written by someone who participated in the Daughter of Islam movement. It's called Daughter of Islam Principle, Praxis, and Movement, right? Even when I am looking for works to use as sort of source material on writing about the Daughter of Islam movement, this is one of the main things that I turn to. 
Um, and, it's, and it's short and readable, but it has a lot of really important information. Dr. Kamal Hassan Ali is a professor of ethnic and gender studies at Westfield State University. Um, and he's one of um, a handful of folks who, who has been a part of a project to document the history of the Dark Islam movement. Another one of, uh, of, of my, my beloved uncles, uh, brother by the name of Sheikh Mahmoud Ibrahim, who we had hoped might be with us today, but had to attend to some family matters. He also wrote another memoir called uh, The Dark Islam Movement in American Odyssey, right? Both of these books, if I'm not mistaken, come out of this this uh, effort to preserve the history of the Dark Islam Movement. Again. From Sister Aisha Lagalia, right? She was instrumental in, 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 in sort of in, in, uh, initiating this, right? While she was at the Shamburg. And what I want to ask Dr. Kamal, Sheikh Kamal, because you don't know the doctor stuff as much, right? Yeah. Uh, I want to ask Sheikh Kamal if, if, if he can give us a little bit of a sort of um, a little bit of a sort of autobiographical snapshot of his journey through Islam, right? And, and when you listen, I want you to listen for some of the communities and some of the different factors that I mentioned in my sort of introductory comments, right? But I was hoping you could share a little bit with us about how you came to Islam and your journey through Islam and your work in Islam over the years, inshallah. Sure. Inshallah, Sheikh Mohammed That was great, by the way. This man is uh, a credit to the movement, a credit to Islam. And and uh, now as a, a wife, we can effectively call and rightfully call the first lady. Uh, what a dynamic duo, period. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. It's hard to, for me to distill all that's been said because my brother uh, Rasul has given us a really concise terse and accurate accounting of this history, which is so little known. As for me, um, when I was young, I, have a, I come from a family of musicians. My brother, Juni, played with the greats, from Pharaoh Sanders, we got a piece on his soul, uh, to Dexter Gordon, to, to the best of his. My father was a piano player and an arranger, so people like Della Reese used to come to our house because the piano player does all of the arrangements for these people they come and perform their art. So uh, I was a trumpet player and I uh, was on my way to play charts so way back with join Johnny Carson's band and become famous as a third chair trumpet player. These are jokes, you know. Come on now. <laughs> so so uh, you know, I have roots in New York City. I went to a very good prep school in Massachusetts. And I, I was forced to leave. I think, as, as they said, I had communist tendencies at age 17 or whatever it was. So I had a full scholarship to Howard University. They bought that up. A guy named Marshall Dean, I had to write a paper to, I guess, denounce my political point of view. And I wrote 15 pages, but it wasn't good enough. So I said, all right, salam alaikum. And those days I probably said later. I wasn't Muslim in those years. And um, it was a good thing, because I ended up coming to this institution, Bar Wave Columbia. Um, I kind of had some problems, because I had one foot in scholarship and the other foot in um, the street, for want of a better term. Um, I had a, a motley assortment of friends and compadres that I really liked to be around, and some of them were of the caliber that I went to places like Columbia, like my brother. But others were not. So I got caught up in stolen cars and whatever, whatever. And then being at the Bursar's office, that was my way of getting through school at Columbia. She liked me a lot, so she gave me a shot at NYU. I came here. Um, I don't know the year. And I worked in the Bursar's office, sending dunning letters to student to loan, student loans. And because I was sort of uh, a risk, I went out to lunch. Right around the corner here, as a matter of fact, with three of my colleagues from the Bursar's office. I came back and I was fired, the only one who was fired. So that started something called the Student Worker Action Committee, because at the time, the only people of color at NYU, black Americans in particular, were running elevators or worked in the kitchen, or they were sweeping up whatever you guys left behind. So the SWAC, 
Student Worker Action Committee, we hired a guy named Bill Kunstler as our attorney, um, and we went to work. I even know who Bill Kunstler is. Very famous very civil rights uh, attorney. Hey, thank you for Bill Kunstler, I guess. <laughs> yeah, he was, he represented the Chicago 7, a guy by the name of H. Rap Brown, who became Jamil out of media, man, so forth and so on. So, um, the, fast the, forward. folks in Attica, too, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. First time we've been doing history, don't you feel? Good guy, good guy. Um, so, my interest in Islam was piqued by my senior brother, Juni, this physician who traveled the world, Japan, everywhere else. And uh, he was saying to me at the time, there was a tension between my brother and some musicians in the nation. He said, man, don't ever join them again. So I liked the nation. I liked what um, Malcolm had to say. In fact, it was Malcolm, or Hajman Nick Shabazz, let get it correct. And Hajman Nick Shabazz, he changed his name. I don't want people calling me Brian Marshall. And I doubt that Hajman Nick would, I think it's better we call him that. Uh, to be accurate, if nothing else, in other words. And Hajj Malik al -Shabaz. I read his book. Um, at the time I was working downtown and I was uh, frequenting Hollywood and a guy named Louis Alcindor became Muslim. And I had friends who grew up with him, one in particular, he's from Dykeman. My friend's in Dykeman. So I got to know something about his journey. And I was really stunned by his brother with everything, man. I mean, he just signed with Milwaukee, a lot of money. And he became Muslim. And by the way, he used to write for Harley Land. And that also got my attention because he was a fantastic writer, very brilliant. Now, I guess many of you know this by now, or you should. Karim is a, a unique individual on a lot of levels. But he became Muslim, and right? that registered with me. I'm sorry, do y'all know who else said there is Karim Abdul Jabbar? <laughs> Just walk Who's an asterisk? <laughs> Sister, you are the case. You must be one of my contemporaries. I'm not outing you, I'm just saying. Yeah, 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 God bless you for that. Um, so, Korean becomes Muslim, and, and um, I, my interest in Islam peaked. So now, I'm working at uh, GPO, post office, 33rd, right there. There's a brother there by the name of Zain Malik Shakur. And Zayn Malik Shukur used to come to work with a little fez. Outstanding in that regard. He was a small, very, very um, uh, humble, but extraordinarily bright brother. And I kind of gravitated to him. And we hung out together on the weekend, we party together. And he was a fantastic seamster, I've got to say. He was a tailor. And in those years, we were wearing something called dashikis, African prints. And Zayn sold the best that she did. So, of course, I was resplendent in my reliance <laughs> that she did. Hanging out with Zayn Shakur um, and listening to him talk about whatever we talk about was usually black militancy, um, white oppression, white supremacy, what to do about it. Um, Zayn, by the way, is oh, Tupac Shakur's um, and uh, because at the time, I guess Tupac was floating around in the ether somewhere. Right? I'm just saying, as a matter of fact, that family was a very unique family, including a son and so forth and so on. Um, and at the time, I didn't know this at the time, Zayn was involved in a lot of uh, very strong, deliberate, militant, extreme responses, you could say. Well, you could say there were natural responses if you're serious about trying to deal with racism, if you're really serious about it, you hate the fact that black people were being brutalized, murdered, being trapped from birth to the prison system. The cultural notion of the pipeline was very much a part of my life. I spent my little bit of time in Raymond Street in the Atlantic, Atlantic Avenue, not too far from here, in Kew Gardens. Um, for the little thing, I mean, the whole thing was to get a little ratchet on a brother and then you do something that's sort of like serious, they send you away for a long period of time. And I was on that track. So, um, Zay told me to come to his house one night. He lived on Aperduck Avenue in the Bronx. So I went there and he said, we're having a meeting tomorrow, I want you to come. Also, I come to the meeting. 
And uh, I thought it was something about Islam because I was really trying to pull stuff out of Zayd about his, his religion. And he was in the more side somewhere, I found out later, obviously. And um, the brothers that came, I didn't know them, but it was really a sort of a litmus test for me to join this group that they were a part of. And the question that was asked, so I will repeat here, but they wanted to know if I was interested in some really outside stuff. And of course, I had to tell them, no, man, I'm not about to. I mean, it's uh, felonies that involve taking someone's life. But uh, it got my attention when I went a few weeks later. It just so happened that he met me up here as wife. Was my best buddy's sister. It is the Imam Yahya Bukharin. from Dallas. And his best name is Sekou Abdul Salam. And Sekou got drafted. He was going to Vietnam. And his sister said, Before you go to Vietnam, I want you to talk to the Imam and get serious about your life and understand what's going on here. So Sekou went to talk to the Imam, and I went with him. He and I were both, uh, I would say, heroin, functioning heroin abusers. Heroin abusers, functioning, we said, because we did it right. Functioning heroin abusers. You saw Pulp Fiction? You saw the old, uh, what's his name? Uh, John Travolta. John Travolta played. We were like that. We got out on weekends, whatever. So quite naturally, we go to see the imam and do a little stuff. And I'll never forget, it had to be June, June 21st, I'm sorry, August 21st of 1969. Because that's the day and the year that Zionists chose to burn down the Laksa Masjid. So I went to talk to the Imam on that day, not knowing anything about the Laksa Masjid or, or Maya Kahan or any of that stuff. And the Masjid was on something. And, you know, we went to talk to the Imam, and he's on the corner with us. And I had a little reputation, I, I like to talk a lot about a lot of different things. So. I mean, I think it's people knew who I was, and the imam kind of knew that I was just sort of like a militant revolutionary. And um, as he was talking, a car would pull up, and a brother would get out, and they'd go and say, Assalamu alaikum wa ta'ala I don't know what they're talking about, but they gave the imam big respect. Another car would pull up, and the same thing would happen, and he'd continue his conversation with me. The third, fourth car pulled up, and the brother gets out, and I can see it, the outprint or the imprint, or whatever it was, of a sort of shotgun. On the stove. On the stove. He said, wait a minute. What's going on here, say? <laughs> brother lied to me. So I asked him, hey, what's, what's happening, brother? He said, well, um, the Yahudis, that was his term, burned down, or tried to burn down. Uh, the Mosque of Al-Aqsa in Jerusalem. And my response to that was, so what? What did they have to do with this brother with this sort of peace? He said, well, um, brother get ready to go on patrol. Because at the time there was a militant group called the Jewish Defense League who were very militantly anti-Islamic. Um, so much so that a good brother who I love dearly was assaulted on Lexington Avenue. And I knew something about this, but I wasn't really clear. I got clear clarity that day. And so I was going out to meet the women who were coming off from work to make sure they got home okay. And then to patrol that part of Dollar. We call Dollar's Night means looking to go to peace, as most of you know. And at the time, none of us were making sure that the abode of peace was indeed the abode of peace. If you know what I mean. Can I, can I jump in and ask a question? Yes. Was, was this something that was common at the time? Um, people might be familiar with the history of the Islam, the nation of Islam, but this, this kind of, these efforts to secure, of people in the community trying to secure their own communities as opposed to maybe relying on law enforcement or something like that. Was oh, that yeah, common at the time? It was rather common, but I think there was a difference. It was that this was patrolling a specific neighborhood. Um, and that, I mean, the deacons of defense, there's all kinds of certain other groups that, that you know, people, my brother Charles Stubbs put a book out, you know, Charlie. Yes. It's called That Nonviolent Stuff Will Get You Killed. 
Charlie Cobb was in the Mississippi Delta. We went to the same school together. He was on his way to, to Mississippi as part of SNCC, and I was on my way to try to figure out how to get my hands on some weapons. And I wasn't really cut out for the cigarette in the forehead. And I knew it. And I had all the respect he did then for Charles Cobb, and even more because, of course, you know, H. Rap Brown and Stovell and the guys involved in the movement, they have big respect for Charlie Cobb. So anyway, and this is important to say that because I mean, you see this such idea of brotherhood is um, in response to racism and, and the violence of racism that was perpetrating on people of color, particularly black Americans, that, that drew us together, man. That was nothing that we we succumbed to. This is of white supremacy and the, the, the notion that somehow we were in fear wasn't a part of my cultural reality at all. And brought that I hung out with. So um, that got my attention. I went to talk to his wife, Asma. He said, who was going to take Shahada? And I was on, a, on, on a, the, 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 the path to do that. And I was working at the time um, since post, uh, post office. I had a job at Human Resource Administration on Wood Street in Manhattan. There was an assistant in Florida who, when I would at lunch time, she would go to a little room and close the door. And I would say, okay, she wants to go I really like this. Very cool. She dressed with a sort of a sort of a modified Islamic attire. And one day I walked by and she was making salat. And at the time I'm hanging out with Zaid, I'm hanging out with five percent of Jews, I'm whatever. I had my little kufi. So Farina said, when she saw me, she said, uh, just call me Kofi. Hey Kofi, did you you saw me body? I, I thought I saw you with it. I said you did, I'm so sorry, I didn't know that you were doing it. I thought it was having a seizure, man. That's why I thought it was so cool. So, was this the first time you ever saw someone make collapse? Absolutely. So, you know, what, what is happening? And uh, so she did talk, but you did sort of this little book. It was the Smack of the and then it was the Transliteration. And that's how it's so weird to teach people that are making the Quran at the time. So she said, Come on, do you, do you, rec do you recognize this? It looked like shorthand to me. I said, No. Said, what is it? I said, That's the Muslim prayer. Do you pray? You're a Muslim, aren't you? I said, yeah. You pray? No, nah, man, I got time to pray. Oh. It's, it's business out here. Pray. <laughs> so she told me, if you're interested in Islam, there's a masjid on 8th Avenue, 125th Street, 303. You should go there. And she said, this is going to be a, 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 a janazah, a funeral meeting. At that masjid, by that time, I was, you know, I would talk to the imam. So the Islamic thing was something to turn to read the book over again. Um, Malcolm X, blah, 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 autobiography. Kareem taking shahada. And I'm messing with his cut buddy, his brother Wally Shabazz. I'm really, really poor. For Wally, of course, you know, I'm even poor. So I'm good to the same man. I did some, whatever it was, some bacon. Wally said, come on, you can eat that plus. Us. He would, you know, really come down hard in a way that got my attention. I'm saying, well, why? I guess when I heard about pork and all that, it was in the, in the atmospherics of my culture, my life. All these things combined to coalesced and began the, 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 the real serious questioning of who am I and what am I doing? So let me ask you a question. Sure. So at what point did you begin, and, 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 and for folks who may not be familiar with, like you mentioned, the Bible centers and whatnot, at what point did you begin to self-identify as a Muslim, even if you weren't praying and everything yet? And what were some of those factors sort of in the ether? Like, just to give folks who may not know that history a snapshot, you mentioned, I, I mean, I know that you're talking about folks who were in the Panther Party, the Black Liberation okay. Army, and the Bible centers. But and just to give people, right, right. All right. All so to give people the snapshot of how it was that a person could now be identifying as Muslim, but your entry point is the politics, the black culture, and not, you know, not praying yet. <laughs> yeah, right. It has to do with Africa. I was in Columbia, I told you. Yeah. There's a bar on Broadway. It's called Broadway. I used to go there from time to time. There's a brother there from Nigeria mm -hmm. and, and another brother from Ghana. But if you got to revive my attention, so, so, 
And that's why that didn't come or try to make this come and plus, I'm reading all about the Krum and Ahmed and the Torre, I'm reading all about um, the revolutionary movements and, uh, and socialism in, in, in Sub Saharan Africa and in, in Tanzania, Kenya. Um, and that was my focus at the time. So I'm really being drawn into this, into this whole African thing. And my African is very, very important to me. My mother's people are coming from Ethiopia. Um, so I knew I had that, and I think they were, they were Jews. Um, so that was sort of floating around as well, but um, it was really, it was really, really nothing. What the biography when he said when he made the house, he saw people who were working in all these different colors. And as much as I, I've never been a guy who hated white people, who I knew, the ones I didn't know. <laughs> I'm just saying, if you pass the litmus test, you hang out with us, and go, well, I'm doing a musician, I'm casting a play. Right. I moved with my brothers, and my brother played with his, my father. So, so I knew I knew they were cool white people, but I was really, really um, grasping and trying to keep my arms around what it means to be an African, and 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 that was my question. Man, is to that, should I be messing with that? And then my son was born. my son, and now I'm really starting to look at He's like. Two months old. Around the same time, he was born in July. It happened in August. The thing of so I went to Fair Creek, and that seemed fake. I walked into that masjid, and you've been there, I'm sure, right? No, by the time I came around, you were at the I just learned about it from yeah. speaking with you. Huge, huge room with no chairs. I'm saying, what are the chairs? Are? <laughs> <laughs> you got a funeral in there, no chairs. And Farina was there, and there was some sister there. The brother's name was, was Hassan from Mali. And the Janazah was from a brother in Mali, which didn't come to with me. So he got me up here to pray, this guy's praying for somebody who's like, Mom. First of all, where is Mali? <laughs> <laughs> it's a basis. But um, it was so warm and so inviting. There's another question about why I was there with the Dalu al Islam. And, and um, I, it, it's at that point that I just had decided. I got to find Yahya and teach him. So I go the next day to something happen. I just want to, again, this is Yahya, I said Yahya from Green, the founder of the He's the one who gave me doubt. And I, you know, one of the things he said to me, by the way, when I was talking to him, because the conversation got kind of deep. And I was talking about revolution, and blah, 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 and you know, we playing, and I'm high. I feel like my brother came up with that shot gun. That's okay, so you up real quick. Real quick. <laughs> it would take flat. <laughs> so he said, it's come out about this revolution. He said, if, if Allah loves you, he'll show you that the revolution begins with you. Not outside of you. It begins with you. What are you about? What are you really about? So, look, I knocked on the door. Salaam alaykum, Hasla. Okay, yeah. Is the Imam, I want to take Shahada. The Imam is gone. Where is he? He's in Mecca. In Mecca? For what? <laughs> he made Hajj with four or five brothers because Jahal Akbar had gotten the attention of Ramat al Islami, Muslim world league, and of course they want to fund things like that. So one of the things that they did was allow take Yahya Abdul Karim, and the four, three or four other brothers to make Hajj. Do you know around what year this was? 69. 69. So, it's So I said, when is he coming back? She said, with a quote, those brothers have been trying to get to Mecca for so long, they may not ever come back. <laughs> really? So what should I do? You should go to, <laughs> you should go to, okay, we should go, you should go to field to take Shabbat. And that's what I did. Put Shahada with a brother named Hassan Abdul Majid, who was really doing stuff. State Street Mark, that was when he was stationed, but he was working with uh, Imam Sheikh. Uh, uh, da, no, 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 no. K. Ahmed Taufik, my name is Kamal Tin, my name is Kamal Because of Taufik. And Sheikh Taufik is the founding Imam of the Masjid of Islam. And a great teacher he was. 
So I would go to, to three or three for our good classes. On Wednesday, and then on Saturday, if I lived in Brooklyn, you should go to Brooklyn because the brothers are here. So I'll do Brooklyn. There's a lot of stuff that happened in that, but what happened that so I took you out of, I'm taking these classes, the first week, second week, third week, and learning my object, that type of that. And I'm saying, well, what are we going to do, you know, get down with the stuff? What do you mean? You know, this, that's, this is good, but, you know, um, we're going to go into our community and, and, and try to do dope. I said, well, I don't know for what? I said, well, that's people in the community, right? And that's when there's another quote, there are no politics in this land. Um, and this is where were you taking these classes at? Station. Um, no politics in Islam. I'm reading about Nansa Musa, I'm reading about different brothers, I'm reading about Muhammad Islam. Well, I gotta find the brothers with lots of politics. And of course, you know, down in the, you know, I then came back. I beelined it to 50 to her from the place, and that's where I became uh, involved in that book. I was the editor of uh, John Akbar from the time we started to the last edition. Uh, you were the editor of Jihad Akbar from the time it started yeah. to the last edition. In fact, the first edition was uh, one of those, you know, just like the 69. <laughs> I think to my uncle, actually, actually to my uncle in Massachusetts, who printed the first edition. And, and there was an edition where I went to the Church of the Master because at that time, I, I took to Islam like a fish to water. You know, you, had, you know, I, we were all in competition with one another. There was a white brother from, uh, from the Bronx, Umar. You know, he learned a surah, I have to learn two surahs. And if he learned two, I have to learn three. It was a cool competition. Yeah. And both, but, but the beloved Shrek that we both on to try to piss him in a nice shot. Man. So, um, um, I don't really know what to say about that. It's not in all those years, from 1969 to 74, a lot happened. Uh, the movement grew, we were put into the prison committees. Uh, we went to uh, establish Madrasa uh, de Shahidain, um, the, the school. The school of two martyrs, some of our brothers were killed in the attempt to assassinate the Imam. Um, I can say this, I'll say this, I hope you're paying attention. Yeah, I mean, there might have been, I don't know, we had brothers, we had a map in our in the man's office. There was a pin for every city that the Majid be joined the Dalai Islam. And that thing looked like music. <laughs> and there, I mean, just about everything. We started, of course, on the East Coast and, and for Jersey and, and Brooklyn. And, and then we went to North Carolina, went to Atlanta, South Carolina, Texas, Detroit, Cleveland, Los Angeles, and then a lot of different massages that were from small towns in between. And these were all places that yeah. had massages affiliated with the Dalai Lama. It took bear to be a man. Can you talk a little bit about, about what that was? The bear. Yeah. The bear was a, basically essentially that you would follow the imam's direction, provided that that did not violate the soul of the Quran. It was a very, very simple. But it meant that basically you were down with this movement. Um, and the movement, you know, that, that book, by the way, was supposed to be the, the, the impetus for different massaging all around the country, the part of the Dalai Islam to do similar efforts. It was supposed to be a template that they would follow. And that's why it's set up the way it is. It's the outline. It's basically an outline of how Muslims in the Dar practice the religion in terms of the five pillars of Islam, how we did the, how, how he was transposed into the lives of Muslims in the community. How Salah, it's a centrality of Salah. I'm speaking fast now because I'm on, I'm on the clock here. The centrality of Salah, of, of, of Zakat, of 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 Ramadan, of Hajj, and how these things played out through practice, through the actual practical application of these things. In a movement that was about establishing Islam. It's safe to say also that when you began to break down the people in the movement, a lot of them were very Vietnam veterans. A lot of them. But something called RAD. RAD was a paramilitary group that the brothers used to, to, to train by running around the reservoir in Brooklyn with fake rifles. And these guys, everybody knew, the police knew, they were monitoring us all the time. They had to, wouldn't you? <laughs> back in Puerto Rico, running around in the Arabs, running around the, the, the reservoir with make-believe AR-15 or 16s, whatever they were, maybe they were in 16s, I've been dating myself. 
Um, and, and of course, we had bazaars, we had a lot of things that were going on that were really about until the exposition again of and, the practice. And bazaars were, who were, who were the bazaars like? Oh, well, the street kids. We rope off the street men, invite all non Muslims and people of cultural differences would come, maybe Muslims, but it was an umbrella for people in the community that to attend an event that was Islamically inspired. It was about the Muslims. Um, the Imam, by the way, never spoke publicly, he only spoke to Muslims. Um, I remember when people celebrated the, the Maulid, which we never did. But we took that opportunity to have a discussion. He did a speech, uh, maybe an hour. Um, a very unique uh, brother, I have to say, his, his interpretation of Islam always kind of got me. He, he was a verbal like me, all about the boy, so to speak. Imam Yahya. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, how did the movie come to an end? Well, I don't want to talk about that not publicly because it's a lot of. Uh, when the brothers were assassinated, they, someone tried to assassinate our Imam. Imam Shaq They tried to assassinate him. And it didn't work, but in the end, four brothers were dead. And I think, and I thought then and think now, that that was a way of telling the Dalai Islam movement that you guys are too big for these Christians. There's too much stuff going on here. Um, you know, you've got all this experience with brothers coming back from the war. You've got brothers really committed to this religion. You've got the example of Black Panther Party was basically wiped out by coming to the um, and others. And now you got you guys. And I think the Imam knew and realized that if if they got to that point, that brothers would fight and we would lose. There's no fight against the United States government, against the national guard. It's the army naval marines. So then you become Zayd Shakur. For him, for Zayd Shakur, I don't think it's for Zayd Shakur. For him, the revolution came. And he died fighting away the revolutionary fights. And, 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 and the actual actualization of the situation. So anyway, um, I think that's the best I can do with the time we have. Well, I want to ask you one last question, and then I'm going to kind of take maybe five minutes to kind of Try to thread a couple things together, and then we'll open up for Q and A. But I, I'd like to ask you one more question before we make that transition. What would you say is the impact? Oh, sorry. Thank you. Y'all got to hear anything I have to say. So it's all right. <laughs> Thank you. So before we transition to the next part of, of our conversation, I want to ask you: What would you say is the impact? of the Islam movement on what Islam looks like in New York and in America today, right? Because what, what we hope people can take away from this is when they go into their community now, they go say the National Taqwa in Brooklyn or, or what have you, they can begin to see, they can make a link between this history that they're learning about tonight and what they see on the ground. We mentioned, I think, in passing both Imam Jamil uh H. Rap Brown, member of the Black Panther Party, SNCC, Student Now by the Coordinating Committee, who becomes incarcerated in connection to his organizing, his activism, becomes Muslim in prison through, I believe, his relationship to members of the Dalai Islam movement. Ismail Rahim. Um, and of course, Imam Jamil al goes down to Atlanta, becomes one of the most prominent imams really in the country in the, in the 90s, I would say. Um, and is now incarcerated again, I, I believe, or for conspiratorial reasons, on some truck up charges, made me a lot liberate him. Um, but yeah, just if you could maybe wrap up by maybe pointing to some of those connections so that people who are just learning about this history can start to understand the impact of the Dawn of Islam movement on what Islam looks like in, in America today. That's a rough, a rough <laughs> um, Dal Islam affected a lot of people from a broad swath of, of black and Hispanic and white culture because it was a multiracial group. Many people don't know that. Most of those were Europeans. A lot of people are people. In fact, really loud in the autobiography where he said, when he made the house, he saw people who represented all these different colors. And as much as I, and I know a bit of guy who hated white people who I knew, which ones I didn't know. <laughs> I'm saying, just say, if you pass the litmus test, you hang out with us, and you know, well, I'm a musician, man. I'm casting the play. Right. My, my, my brothers and my brother played with this, my father. So, so I knew, I knew the cool way, but I was really, really um, grasping and trying to get my arms around what it means to be 
and, and African. And, and, and that was my question, man, is to, should I be messing with heroin? Mm -hmm. And then my son was born. My son was And now I'm really starting to look at something. He's like two months old, around the same time. He was born in July, it happened in August. This is the thing I'm talking about. So I went to 303, and that sealed the thing for me. I walked into that last year. If you've been there, I'm sure, right? No, by the time I came around 303, I just closed. Oh, okay. I just learned about it from yeah. speaking with people. Huge, huge room and no chairs. I'm saying, where the chairs are? <laughs> <laughs> and the funeral, there you know, no chairs. And Farina was there, and a couple of sisters were there. The brother's name, his name was Hassan, from Mali. And the Janazah was from a brother in Mali, which didn't come to me. He said, come to me, got me up here, pray. this guy's been praying for somebody who's in Mali. First of all, where is Mali? It's <laughs> some basics. But um, it was so warm and so inviting. There's another question about why I was there, what did I know about Islam? And, and um, I, it, it's at that point that I just had decided I got to find Yahya and teach him. So I go the next day to something Avenue. I just want to, again, this is Yahya, Sheikh Yahya from Green, one of the founders of the Islam. Yeah, he's the one who gave me a dollar. I, you know, one of the things he said to me, by the way, when I was talking to him, because it comes into that kind of deep. I was talking about revolution, and blah, 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 and, you know, people playing, and I'm high. Okay, until that brother came over there, shot me. And so did you up real so quick. Real quick. <laughs> Give it a take flat. So he says, come on, like the revolution, Kofi. He said, if, if Allah loves you, He'll show that the revolution begins with you. It's not outside of you. It begins with you. So what are you about? What are you really about? So, look, I knocked on the door. Salaam uh, alaikum, Hasla. Hope you got. Is the Imam, I want to take Shahada. The Imam is gone. Where is he? He's in Mecca. In Mecca. For what? <laughs> he made Hajj with four or five brothers because Jahal Akbar had gotten the attention of Rahm Khan al Islami, Muslim World League, and of course they want to fund things like that. So one of the things that they did was to allow take Yahya Abdul Karim, Rahmatullah Alay, and four or four other brothers to make Hajj. Do you think around what year this was? 69. 69. 69. So, it's So I said, when is he coming back? She said, it's a quote. Those brothers have been trying to get to Mecca for so long, they may not ever come back. <laughs> really? So what should I do? You should go to You should go to okay. We should go you should go to three oh three and take Shahada. And that's what I did. I took Shahada with a brother in Hassan Abdul Majid, who was really doing stuff at State Street Mark, that was when he was stationed, but he was working with uh, Imam Sheikh uh, uh, no 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 K Ahmed Taufik my uh. come on take my name from come on come on I don't know because of so Taufik and Sheikh uh, at and um, the original book is 500 pages yeah <laughs> um, I had two copies which I gave away yeah. this is a African Muslims in Antebellum America yeah uh, the original title is Antebellum Muslims in America the details switching for that edition but um, when when that book came out in '89, '79, I'm uh, sorry, I got called back from UMass because of this issue with uh, uh, Sheikh Jalani. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. So I'm going to get into all of that. But um, I can safely say that that you know, Alan. Alan Austin's point of view on, on African Muslims was that he was looking for some direct link. And what you said earlier really resonated with me when you said that, you know, there is no direct link between these brothers, but uh, the idea that they exist and the reality of knowing that they exist, that they, they were the Muslims, were the Africans of note, who could read and write, who had historical backgrounds, etc., etc. And that is sort of like the way I, I feel a lot of people about dollars. Mm -hmm. Put in a direct link, but they know it's there to the contributions of the Dallas Right. Thank you. Thank you all.
Um, and so we're gonna we're gonna shift to, to Q and A in a moment. So we'll start get your questions together. I don't know if we'll have people we'll come up. Then. I'll, okay. I'll do it. Yeah, yeah. But um, just just a couple of sort of key points I want to kind of call us to. So when when Sheikh Kamal was speaking, he spoke about you know some of the communities I mentioned, and uh, I want to just just make sure we walk away kind of with an understanding of the terrain. So now I keep mentioning the mosque of Islam Brotherhood. And it occurred to me I hadn't given any kind of context for the Muslim Islamic Brotherhood. So this is a community of folks. Actually, you have when when Al-Hajjim Shabazz, Rakhda Ali, Malcolm X, when he leaves the nation, is kicked out of the nation, however you frame it, he there's people who leave with him. And they form an organization, he formed an organization called the Muslim Mosque Incorporated. And that ultimately sort of reforms again as the Mosque of the Islamic Brotherhood around Sheikh Ahmed Tawfiq, Rakhda Ali, who's one of the people who, who joined Malcolm, who's a part of the Muslim Mosque Inc., who um, really, with the support and the direction of, of, of Hadim and Shabazz, goes to Egypt and studies for about four years, at least four or five years, and then comes back and becomes the, the leader of that movement, which is still around today on 113th Street, St. Nicholas Avenue. Um, another thing that I, I want to mention is just again to point out so, in this 1960s, 70s moment, you have the emergence of and I'm going to try to say this as succinctly as possible, right? But you have um, a kind of burgeoning black consciousness. Um, you have a number of black and Latino organizations, groups like the Black Panther Party, the Young Lords. Um, but Islam in, a, in, a, in an understanding of Africanity, we might say, right, as a part of that. Now, today, and I, and I recently read a, read a really good book, uh, or, or my wife told me about a really good book by a guy named Russell Rickford about um, African-American independent schools um, called We Are African People. But he, one of the things he talks about is kind of, in the 80s, you see kind of a breakdown where you have, you had debates for a very long time between um, black organizers and activists who, there's not enough time to say this in as nuanced a way as I really just want to, but who are advocates of a kind of a, a kind of Marxist kind of analysis, and those who had more of an emphasis on kind of African culture. It's a really overly simplified way of putting it, right? But in this 1960s, 70s moment, especially in a place like New York, like on the West Coast, people have a you know some of the Panthers and whatnot. They have a critique of what they call African cultural nationalism. But on the East Coast, you have someone like a Zaid Malisha Shakur whose father, Saladin Shakur, was a member of the Muslim Mosque Inc. and Malcolm's organization of Afro-American community, who's simultaneously Muslim and an, Afri uh, an African nationalist and a Marxist and a revolutionary. And this, and this, totally. Totally. And this wasn't weird in a place like New York City in the 1960s and 1970s, right? You mentioned that this family name, Shakur, this becomes an extended family network that um, many folks involved in the movement in the East Coast joined. We have Matubu Shakur, who's Tupac's stepfather, who's still incarcerated right now in connection to some of his activism. You have Afini Shakur, who at one time was the wife of the Muba Abdul Shakur, Zayn Malik Shakur's biological brother, right? And of course you have Asada Shakur, who Zayn Shakur gets assassinated by the police, and in that same encounter, Asada Shakur gets incarcerated. And of course, there's some Black, African, Muslim, well, Afrocentric, Muslim, Marxist, whatever you want to call the revolutionaries, yeah, yeah. who break her out. And she's free to this day with political asylum in Cuba. So this is the scene, right? And then, of course, you have the Nation of Islam in the mix as well, right? Which has an impact on folks' consciousness, such that in, in, in New York City, so just imagine in New York City, you have the, 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 the heart or the sort of headquarters of the Daughter of Islam movement, this huge, massive, multi city movement. I think it's in more than 40 cities. Around the country, right? It's, well, Dharma Islam is now come up to date. You know that, correct? Right, right, and right. Uh, Wine dance. Right. And but the man, I don't mean, I'm a thief. Nah, nah. No. So, and this is so right. So you have these kind of like children of the dark, right? But at that time, yes. brothers of the dark. Now they, yeah. they, they kids are the children. They kids are the children. Nah, not at all. Not at all. But you, but you have at the time in the '60s and the '70s. I think it's in like, like like 40 cities. This huge yeah. network of communities around the country. Yeah. So that's headquartered in New York. Then you have Mosque Number Seven with Minister Louis Farrakhan serving as the minister, right? Certainly a dynamic presence, right? Um, and you have the, the Black Liberation Army, this kind of branch of the Panther Party, 
of which the Shakur family is a part. And this is just the vibe in New York City, right? And of course, in 1975, Nabilaj Muhammad passes away, and Imam Wardi Muhammad Rafale takes over, transitions the community into Sunni Islam. And so now, and uh, names Mosque Number 7, changes the name of Mosque Number 7 to uh, Malcolm Shabazz Masjid to kind of heal this rift, right? And so this is this broader context of Islam in New York City, out of which all of the other communities grew. And this is the last thing I'll say before we, we transition into the question and answer. Even the immigrant communities have formed. If you go to Brooklyn right now, you go to Masjid Farouk, right? The genesis of Masjid Farouk is the, the, the broader Arab community that crystallizes around State Street Masjid, right? In the 50s and the 60s that shaped out who the time. State Street Masjid itself, Masjid Dawu, now people go into largely a Yemeni community, right? Yeah. Because of some of the dynamics we begin to allude to, but you know, maybe we can go into more detail yeah. in, in, that, in that neighborhood. In that neighborhood, exactly, exactly. It's in Siraj. And of course, Imam Siraj, right? Siraj in that community, which is largely African. It's a whole other issue, but I can, we can maybe get into that. African immigration. So there's a lot. We basically test the surface. But it's okay because this is the first in the series. Yeah. So yeah. inshallah, you can come back to the remaining inshallah. It's not cute. I have a very hard job. Thank you so much. Thank can you. we just have a minute to just thank this, please? <laughs> Harder task of trying to get all your wonderful questions that I know you have, but we have 18 minutes before the delicious dinner upstairs on the fourth floor. So I am going to be on a timer. You'll have one minute to ask a question, and then I'll pass it over for you for like five minutes, and that really gives us time for three questions. So like, My make it good, good <laughs> questions, please. So yes, all right. So I'll just bring the mic and I'll can, can we maybe ask that people, if they have questions, maybe come down yes, here? Yes, yeah. yes. In, in so, line. Salaam alaikum. Really a beautiful, um, I've come all the way from Atlanta, Georgia, so just really, this is a rare opportunity um, for me to share this question. And um, I've had quite a bit of, of opportunity to travel internationally and heard of connections with the African American community that predates my age my story, and I'm interested to know from your scholarship and, and seeing your status with us about that time period with the DAW and this idea around internationalism, pan-Africanism, what was the solid relationship that was established, meaning if there was travel to um, West Africa, travel to the Middle East, what sustained relationships were there for the DAW, perhaps in exchange of culture, uh, food, in terms of like the, the, the actual meetings that took place in New York City, but also in terms of education as well, if there was something that was sustaining the community from an international presence of relationships. And New York is the United Nations, so there's a lot of transaction of culture and knowledge that's happening there was that tied into the movement. That's a great question, but I have to say that um, Rutgers, I, I ended up in Ghana because of Rutgers. Mm. Kid dropped the scholarship uh, program that he had was going on, and I was asked to take his place, and I did. And I, by that time, I was relatively fluent in Arabic, in terms of Quranic Arabic, and I was on my way to learning how to So I, I have to say, but sort of that, um, I was the only person in Brooklyn's Dharma Slam, Masjid Yassin, who actually went to Africa. I didn't plan to go, but I ended up there. First lady allowed me to go for two months, and I went to Accra and Ghana. And um, because I was Muslim, and I went to the Central Mosque and made Salah, and so they picked up out of my face, I wasn't from there. So they said, where are you from? And they said, this is what we said, from the north. So I'm from Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> so of course, it was a whole thing that people wanted me to talk about Islam and whatever. So I've been going back and forth all these years. Mm -hmm. And this book that's, that I bought is from my brother Yusuf, the bottom one. Mm -hmm. Paradise is Unpaved, it's about the brother from Zongo. The Zongos are all the poor people live in. Most of the Muslims in Ghana came from the north. They're from Nigeria, they're from Mali, they're from, from wherever, the north, you know, um, wherever. And they were killed very poor, so they live in ghettos called Zongo. Any place in West Africa, when you go to Sub-Saharan Africa, you want to find the Muslims asking, in our zone, where is this zone? Where are the African Muslims? 
church where the Catholic priest, that is not wherever it is. And he's from there, but he made, he's a millionaire. And his story's interesting and, and whatever, whatever. But he was my main connection in, in Ghana and brothers like him. So I built a house in Accra. I built a, I'm trying to build a house in Pram Pram, it's called Pram Pram. On a professor's salary, you know, takes a little while. You know? <laughs> If I had money, I'd be dangerous. Of course, I have no money. I'm not that dangerous. But to answer your question, the, 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 the emergence of any kind of real connectedness with West Africa, or even in Africa, from Darul Islam was middle. Although, when I would come back, they wanted to know what's going on. The ship, and I would bring brothers from Africa to the masjid. And then they'd know about it. It's a connection. But it's not anything that strong or that bore any fruit other than in my own particular case. Um, I have to say, though, in the last few years, because of Hassan Sissa, the, the Tijani movement, in Kaulak, in Senegal, there are more and more people, not from Dal Islam necessarily, but from that community who do back, who go back and forth. And you know a couple of them. You know, for sure. Okay. And, I, and, and I'm only going to add on to this a little bit, just because this is like a big part of my research and the book I'm working on now, kind of like, that, that's kind of the framing of what I'm diving into. But just to add on a little bit, so, you know, as I tried to hint that, you know, you have a robust situation in terms of the different understandings of Islam that are played by the 1960s, 1970s. You have kind of a, a relatively mature sort of scene where you have different kind of Muslims on the scene, right? Even Sunni Muslims, right? One sort of subset, Sunni Muslims, that have different understandings of what the relationship between themselves and other communities can and should be, right? So, um, whereas in the Dada and, and this is a moment where you have, and I know you're familiar with this history, but you have people translating the works of people like uh, Malana Maldudi, right? People translating the works of Sayyid Qutub, right? So this is a part of the Dada, right? And so my sense, and, and Sheikh Kamal can correct me if I'm wrong, is that in the Dar, you definitely have people consuming that information and, and translating it to, to, and I don't just mean translating it linguistically, but translating it for this concept. And you, and you certainly had, uh, you mentioned, for instance, the Muslim World League, Rabia Ta Islamiyah, mm -hmm. taking some of the brothers from the Dar to make Hajj and their interest in, in funding the Hal Akbar. Before that, during Sheikh Dawood's time, Sheikh Dawood has a relationship with Prince Faisal, mm -hmm. right? And is, and is funding, um, um, you know, has decent politics, is what I'm saying. I don't, I'm not speaking of nobody, I don't know what's in anybody's heart, but, you know, but he definitely has a commitment to a kind of anti colonial politics that speaks to people like Sheikh Dawood and Malcolm, right? Um, so you have different institutions who have an interest in building relationships with African American Muslims for whatever their own agenda may be, right? Good, bad, and different, right? Um, you also have a burgeoning African immigrant presence. So also in 1976 is when Sheikh Hassan Sisi from Senegal takes his first trip to New York and begins to connect with some of those African-American Muslims who had relationships to West African uh, Muslims. And this is people like uh, our mother, Sister Kareem Abdul Kareem, who was another person we had hoped might come with us tonight, but she's actually in Morocco, right? Um, she's going to 72nd Street, a community I didn't mention, but very important. You all know 96th Street Masjid, right? You know the Masjid on 96th Street? You know it wasn't always on 96th Street. The precursor was on 72nd Street. It's still there today, One Riverside Drive. And this is the masjid where Malcolm X goes to take his shahada and prepares to make hajj, right? One of the imams there at the time was a man named Sheikh Suleiman Dunya, an Egyptian chef who had a, had a unique love for African-American and Latino-American working class Muslims. So this is where Sister Kareem Abdul Kareem was going. Sheikh Ahmed Tawfiq at the mosque of his own brother had a relationship with Sheikh Suleiman Dunya. I mentioned Imam Sayyid Abdul Salam, who was one of the founders of MIB, had a relationship with, with this community. So. By the 1980s, you have people from some of these other communities in Harlem, interesting geography, right, where more West African immigrants are, who are going to West Africa, sending their children to school in West Africa. I have friends now who are in their 40s who flew in and well off who from Brooklyn and from Harlem, right? Whereas in Brooklyn, where you have a stronger Arab immigrant presence, the sort of, you know, the, the, the consciousness globally is a little bit different. So that's just a hint at some, some more things we can talk about, but you do have this sort of connection with other Muslim institutions and communities that is informed by this kind of geography, by right? these different alternative geographies. And by the 1970s, it's not just one. We see now it's not just one. You know, you got some African-American Muslims who look toward the Gulf. You got other African-American Muslims who are looking toward West Africa. You got other African-Americans who are looking toward South Asia, right? 
And this moment that we've been discussing is sort of the beginnings of those relationships just starting to crystallize. Does that make sense? That was a long minute. Hi, Assalamu Thank you for coming and uh, sharing you know, about your work and my experience. Your story about standing up to NYU when you were uh, a student to the Student Worker Action Committee and suing NYU for discrimination, that really resonated with me because I think we're at a historical moment now at NYU. Um, to give you some context, well, I'm suing NYU at the moment for discrimination, similar to your case. Um, to give you some context, at the height of the uh, Black Lives Matter riots when America was burning down, I called NYU and offered the president $500 donation in exchange for 30 minutes on the phone to explain the social and economic solution I had to help uh, people of color and, and, and all people in America suffering uh, from the inequality and, and injustice. Uh, I was ignored. I waited again until the, the, the insurrection on Capitol Hill, another amazing, inc like incredibly bad moment in American history. Offered him the $500 donation again for, to explain this solution. They ignored. Even though he sent two letters to the community saying how he was so sad and would explore options that entire summer how to help uh, people of color and, and people suffering in general. So I pursued more formal, formal channels by submitting my solution to NOE Entrepreneurship Challenge, which offered 25 minimum winners for, for paying entrance. It's not an academic competition. I paid $100 to enter. But they only selected 22 winners, lowered the prize money, and then, and then prohibited me from participating in any more Berkeley Center, um, uh, any more Berkeley Center using any more resources, not letting me be a team member of, so, of more so than one person. You gotta get to the question. So my question is, my question is, what advice do you have for someone who's trying to be an activist and standing up for justice, where the community doesn't support it because they're too scared and cowardly to stand up to the, to the power establishment and the status quo? But our heroes, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his Sahaba, they stood up for the status quo and injustice, even if it came at a risk to them and their reputation. Thank you very much. I'm sorry to be a bad cop, but like the minute has to be a minute because I know that a lot of people have questions and I want to also honor them. So I will pass the mic so they can really address your question. Thank you. I'm sorry. Um, just, just caught up in that institutional malaise, myopia, whatever you want to call it. It's difficult to, to move. An institution that makes its bones by avoiding people like you, just saying. It's reality, my brother. My brother. True. In my humble opinion. By the way, I'm sitting on the microphone, I, I got to ask this one question to think about when, since you told me I was coming in. How many uh, NYU students in the room? Show of hands. Is there a professor by the name of John Ehrlich? Did you have him? Anyone? Okay, that's what I wanted to know. <laughs> he was a SWAT guy. Assume my project for me. Oh, you need this. All right. Did I point Question. Question. Wait, what did he do? Sorry. I History teacher. He graduated from here, from here took a, a PhD, and the last I knew he was, he was a professor in the history department. That was like 10, 15 years ago. And I, someone told me that I'm trying to hook up with him. Long story. A crazy story, but a beautiful story. John Early. John Early. <laughs> I'm doing that. I'm doing that. Okay, we have time for one more question. Shala, any takers? <laughs> it's fine, I'm loud, I can yell. Can, we're actually recording, so it'd be great if we could speak on the mic, so we make sure we have it down. I'll just have you on this side. Appreciate it. Don't cross, please. Don't cross. Oh. oh my God, sorry. sorry. Um, Asalaamu As Alaikum. Uh, just a quick question. So I'm from Tallahassee. There's a Muslim presence there. And I was just wondering if you have any advice for recording the Muslim history, because a lot of it is in elders, uh, mashallah. But I was just wondering how do you go about collecting that history and writing it down for like younger generations once those elders are gone? <laughs> So first of all, may Allah, may Allah give you tawfiq, may Allah bless you for that question. Um, you just got to do it. <laughs> it's super urgent. I actually know um, a brother from the dark who, who I think is in Tallahassee, who <laughs> maybe I can connect you with, if, you know, take my information. But, you know, when I started doing this research, I, you know, I had a couple flip cams. I don't even make flip cams anymore. Um, uh, one of our dear friends, uh, Professor Amir al-Islam, you know, he took me along with him um, 
uh, on an interview he did. And uh, yeah, I just got a couple flip cams from me and a friend of mine just guerrilla style went to interview some Elvis. The quality of interviews is terrible. The sound is terrible. But some of those people I interviewed have returned to Allah. And however humble my little, you know, interview was, if I didn't ask the right questions, the quality, that that now is something we have that we wouldn't have, right? That is a link to, to an older time, you know, a, a documentation of their story that we just wouldn't have. So just don't wait. And there was there have been so many people. We talked about Sister Aisha Ladawiya. She um, was going to connect me with uh, Brother Abdul Razak, who was Minister James, I think, 67X, Malcolm X's personal secretary. He was a brilliant man. And he passed away before I could get to him. You know, I have a lot of stories like that. So, you know, first of all, just do it. Don't wait. Do it. When you get out, call somebody. I'm going to come to town and have to interview you. And now we have so many different resources. You can use Zoom. You know, it doesn't always have to be a perfect situation. If you have to do it remotely, do it. And then the last thing I'll say is there are, alhamdulillah, now more and more resources. Um, a good friend of mine, brother by the name of Maurice Hines, who is his is family, you know, he, uh, he uh, put together a book, a, a sort of guide specifically for helping folks on the community level collect oral histories in their community. So, and if you can find other people who have that interest to coordinate with, be in conversation with them, you know, um, I tell people all the time, this work is too big for one person to do. So, you know, this is like what I write about, but I'm always alley for people. Go interview this person in North Carolina. I can't get to them. Get to them before they pass away, you know. Create that network. Tap into the networks that exist. Um, make sure, you know, we exchange information before you go, because there's even people in this room who I know uh, you might need to be connected to. And in West Africa, every time an elder passes away, a library disappears. So, you know, if you have the capacity to interview one one elder, one uncle, auntie in your community, whether it be African-American, Muslim, Arab, South Asian, immigrant, Muslim, capture those stories. It's urgent. So that's my urgent call. That's maybe my last word is, you know, make some contribution, inshallah, however small it may seem to you now, to preserve this work of preserving the broader history of our community. I got a nickel, I got a nickel that down. And I would suggest, um, even to you said your uncles and others, how many of you have ever thought about interviewing your mothers and fathers? Mm. Or, or grandparents? You should do that, put it on tape or somewhere. Um, there's not a single record of Yahya Abdul Karim's voice at all. The man of one of the largest and most significant Muslim movements in this country. Nothing. Um, or only of his imams, uh, imams, his amirs. Because we had structured, the administrative structure, the same way the prophet did with the years and so forth and so on. So I'm just echoing that, that I think a very profound thing that you should say. <laughs>